Okay. Yep. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Andrew McDonald. Uh, he's a professional software engineer and he has two decades of experience. Uh, his aim for 2015 was to win a T-shirt from Hackaday. And if you look closely, oh, you might yeah. find out if he was successful. Uh, please join me in welcoming Andrew. Thanks for coming. Um, who here thinks this is a great time to be a maker? Got to be a few hands. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. So last year, I created this thing called Century Farm. So I had help from a few friends. Um, I know software and electronics, but I don't know as much about antennas or farming or video production or various other things. Um, there are no lasers, no holograms, no flying cars, but it contributed towards solving a small problem that somebody has, and there are lots of small problems in the world. And even though there are no holographic displays and flying cars that we ourselves can build, it's still cool, because everyone here is capable of making something, whether it's large or small, or physical, or virtual, or both, or whatever. It doesn't matter if you did it the wrong way, or if it's not economically feasible, if you had fun, you did something with other people, it still makes life better. So, Yes. So where did this start? So last, no, it's 2016 now. So Christmas 2014, I was catching up at the local neighbourhood. So I live north of Adelaide, about 70 kilometres. And one of my neighbours farms a paddock around me. So I've got a small block. He's got like 500 acres. I've got like six. Um, so I'm not a farmer. I'm a pretend farmer. We just got a few chooks. So, but he's a tinkerer like me. And we're thinking, we want to make something that's going to be useful for us. And we got talking and he said, well, one of his problems is in Australian summer, you've got headers, which are the machines you use to take a crop with. And they actually present a bit of a fire danger because they're big machines, they hot, they make sparks. You get 40 degree days in South Australia. The crops are very dry. And it's more than just temperature. There's wind and other stuff. So what they have to do is go out and measure grass fire danger index. So you need humidity, you need temperature, and you need wind speed. And what you find is they might have a weather forecast, but even on one paddock, and the, the, the paddock is like a couple of kilometres couple of, couple of kilometers large, the weather can be different from one side to the other. So I thought, well, maybe we could like just build a monitoring system and measure the temperature and the other components of grass fire danger index and maybe save them a drive out to take the header out there and then measure it again and realise they don't need to be there. So that's where it came from. Um, Unfortunately, the world is a complex place, and even if the system that we've built, one hop of, had hundreds and hundreds of nodes, it wouldn't have, would not have prevented the big bushfire that we had in, in November last year. But you do what you can. So the aim of Century Farm was basically to avoid that one, uh, this happening. So this is from a couple of years ago, not far from where I live. The fire didn't go far. The CFS got there, and you know it was. The weather was good. Recently, you may or may not be aware, depending on where you live, we had a massive bushfire in South Australia that was not that far from where I live, but luckily it all went the other way for, for us, not so lucky for, sadly, for other people. Um, but at least the system I'm trying to build might help minimise the chance of this happening for my neighbour. So anyway, that's the next one. Where am I? Go. So what is Century Farm? So we had main requirements, low power, because you're not going to have power out in the edge of a paddock, so solar. Distributed, we want to be able to put a few of them around the place. Um, Australian internet in the country is suboptimal, <laughs> in spite of the uh, <laughs> NPM. Um, people are asking me, well, there's commercial tools for doing this sort of stuff, and a lot of them rely on SIM cards, and if you want to have 30 eventually, who wants to manage 30 SIM cards and have 30 theft targets on your property? So. We figured we'll just go with radio, plus, you know, it was something we hadn't worked with before, let's do it. It ideally needs to connect to the cloud so you can get a notification on your phone, but um, the other part that's important is that's optional because a farmer should be able to collect all the data and have it on their property without relying on a cloud vendor disappearing or whatever other thing might happen and have the data there for their own use. By all means, share it with other people, let someone pay a service if needed to mash it with other stuff, but at least the stuff that you've saved off of your own farm, you should have access to. So put it on a server on your computer. So, um, 
About the time we started on this, I came across a thing called the Hackaday Prize, <coughs> which I'd roughly heard of, and then I went and had a look on the internet while I was looking for some stuff, and I found the ads for this year. So it might have been February, they started promoting this on the Hackaday website, which if you haven't seen it, Google it, go look at it. There's just tons of awesome stuff that people are doing everywhere. And the theme was build something that matters, including food and farming, food. So we thought, well, why don't we just go in this and see what happens? So it had some rules. And what was cool is it's all about participation. You can win prizes just for going onto their website, onto the portal page, and documenting what you're doing. Even if it's a fail, it's still interesting. People like to read about it. They can learn from where you went wrong. And they were giving away all sorts of prizes just for documenting, which is really, really cool. The topic, something that matters, I covered that. Um, you document your progress, you produce a video. You got, it's not hard and fast, it has to be all open source, but they want your stuff to be a fair bit of that, as much as possible, because some things are not practical. And we had our own goals, because we're doing this for fun. I've got a day job where I'm a systems engineer and I'm you know, doing stuff for business and whatever else. I want to come home and hack on things for fun on the weekend, even though it's for a useful purpose. We're going to have fun. And the other thing, we thought we'd push the theme through some of my doco that we're a bit bush mechanic about this. So we're sort of, I like to do good documentation as a general engineer, but at the same time, let's have a bit of fun and push the old, if you're not from Australia, bush mechanic. So, you know, string, twine, gaffer tape, hold the car together while you're driving. Because it's 80 k's from J car. If I want to go buy a circuit, it's a long way to go if I can just rig something up out of parts out of my junk box. So we did it to have fun, learn new skills, and of course, win a t-shirt, which we managed to do. So, and have fun with people you know. And this is the theme of today. So Isaac Newton, and I don't know if he's the first person, but it was the obvious one I found, wrote, if I've seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, which is what the whole world is today with open source. It's all on the shoulders of giants. Everything that you're doing now is because someone else did something before, and Without it, we'd all be a lot poorer. And as part of this, I went through this as part of preparing this talk to work out what to talk about, and I started looking at all the tools I use because I wanted to share useful stuff, and I counted. And there are so, so many open source tools that you can now pull together and build something, software and hardware, by the way, as we've seen. It's 24 plus, it's an approximation because do you count Debian and Ubuntu as one thing? Do you count an operating system and all the things as separate projects? So it's a bit fuzzy, but I've got, you know, Inkscape, LibreOffice, so it's not just the code. Um, I had a bus pirate, which is an open hardware thing that I can use to diagnose SPI, which is a protocol for talking to various microcontroller components. There's a Teensy microcontroller. I've got um, a 3D printer. I've got OpenSCAD, which I use to design stuff for the 3D printer. I had to hack the 3D printer firmware to make it work with the kit that I had slightly differently. And it goes on and on, and they've got Docker so I could put the cloud bit up there so I could get the charts up for the farmer to see. So there's this whole massive pile of stuff, and compared to where we were 20 years ago, 10 years ago, it's just so much better that if you want to build something, even if you don't know how to use it, just go find someone else on the internet and look at what they've done and copy it, even if it's not perfect. So we had a lot of fun in this project. Um, there were lots of prototypes. Most of them were done and then discarded for various reasons. Um, where are we? I should look at this one. I don't have a laser pointer. It doesn't matter. So the top left has a thing in it called a DigiSpark. So that's an AT Tiny Atmel microcontroller that you can shoehorn Arduino things into. And there's a, a humidity controller. So we were learning how to just read the humidity from that because you need that for grass fire danger index. The bottom left, I was doing some trying to work out whether a tiny, tiny solar panel would power this thing. So in that white, uh, I think that was a container that had little wipes. You wipe your kids um, when you change their nappy and you clean up in it. So my daughter's a bit older now, but I kept around these containers because they're useful for this sort of thing. So that's got that ESP8266 you might have heard about. It's hard to see because it's the top, bottom right-hand corner of it. That's the ESP01, the first one that came out for $5. Um, it turns out... And the, the big capacitor in the middle is actually a supercapacitor. So I was trying to use a solar channel to charge a supercapacitor to run the ESP with the Wi-Fi turned off, because I'm not using it for Wi-Fi, just as a microcontroller, to see if I could run it like that. But I just, I couldn't do it. Um, I'd need to go and do more research. So I moved on and tried something else. But there's so much stuff that's so cheap that you can just play with stuff and try and experiment. Even if, 
If I was at work, I wouldn't have done this. I would have had to go and look up all the stuff and engineer it properly, but you can experiment. It was just a thing. And the photo on the right, that's my lad, so I taught him how to surface mount solder as part of this. So if you've got kids, they actually find, and I found this too, surface mounting, as it turns out, is easier to solder than three-hole resistors because you don't have to bend them and line them up and all the rest of it. And until last year at the open radio, I didn't realise that. I'd always pushed it off as too hard. And the kids seem to pick it up really quickly, apparently. So. so this is a shot of the bus pirate and one of the radio modules we used. Uh, that comes from Seed Studio, so one of those... Uh, no, hang on. That comes from Dangerous Prototypes, and usually you buy it from a place called Seed Studio, one of those... Uh, I think they're based in China somewhere, like everything these days. So it's sort of a multi-tool where you can talk serial or I2C or SPI or all these other protocols, but all the f software and everything for it's on GitHub somewhere. Um, as part of this, I wrote a bit of code just to talk SPI from Linux using the bus pirate because at that point I didn't have a dev board up that I could hook it up to properly. So that's somewhere on GitHub too. I guess you can grab me after if you can't. Can everyone see that or not? It's probably a bit long anyway, so it'll be on YouTube. Now, of course, you've got to be a bit pragmatic. So for what I needed, we were trying to get long range radio up to several kilometres. Um, I'm not a ham or an expert in any of that stuff. And I wanted something I could easily program because I'm a software guy. So that sort of took priority. But I also want something really cheap. And there were lots of modules that people have been around for a long time, but I went searching through all the Internet of Things stuff and found some fairly new thing called LoRa, which I guess is long range. Um, it turns out there's two LoRa's. There's LoRa, the proprietary chip that... So LoRa is a proprietary physical layer radio protocol. It's also LoRaWAN, which is an open source but corporately sponsored layer for doing media access control a bit further up the stack. So it gets a bit confusing, unfortunately. But I'm only using it for the module because they were 20 bucks, whereas most of the dev kits were over $120, and I wanted to learn how to program it myself. I'm doing point-to-point -point links for Century Farm too because I know you can do mesh networks and all the rest of it, but I didn't have the time to get up and get the software stack going for all the rest of it. There were difficulties shoehorning some of it into a normal Arduino as well, and it was just, well, we don't need a mesh network when all we want to do is relay some stuff in from a paddock. So. This is where the Hackaday Prize was so cool. Because they basically said, uh, fairly early on, put up your design. You don't have to build anything. You've got six months. Just talk about it. Or so on. And then they came out the next month after. We've got circuit board credits for a, a, a fabbing company. I think it was Osh Park. They make purple ones, but there's others. So they, they were one of the sponsors. So they had credits. And they gave them out to 50 entrants. And they basically said, just prove that you need these credits. <laughs> So, yeah. Um, so that, that came in very handy because I hadn't, at the point I built this, I hadn't actually even thought about PC, PCB fabbing. The last time I'd ever done it was probably 20 years ago when you needed to do acid and all that sort of, and all the rest of it. It was just too hard. So one of the massive things I learned last year is how far everything's come in 20 years. I was able to use a circuit board design tool which do all the layout on the computer, which I knew existed, but I never looked at it before. Um, I personally used one called Eagle, which runs on Windows, and I just knew how to use it, so I learned it. I know there is KICAD if you want something open source that does the same thing. It's really odd, because Eagle, a lot of the open hardware projects on GitHub actually have Eagle design files. So it might be closed software, but it's open hardware supporting. So there's like this big shade of gray everywhere. So anyway, it did the job for me. Um, so the green board on the right is an Carambola too. So I actually got those a couple of years ago when the dollar was a lot better and they came out of Europe and I paid 30 and now to get the same thing would be 60. That runs Linux OpenWRT. It's got a whole bunch of GPIOs exposed. So it's basically the same kind of chipset that you get in your average home consumer router, but rejigged for people to build other things other than routers on top of it. So here and on the left is again the radio module. There's a real time clock and a barometer for measuring air pressure and other bits and pieces. So, yeah, that photo won a circuit board credits, which came in handy, because we built the ones on the right then, which are a bit neater. Now, on the top right of that picture is a thing called a stick vice, which was another prize we won, just because they go through and give them out, which is really cool. So, go to this, I think this runs every year, it's run two years in a row, you know, participate, even if you don't have anything that's exciting, 
you just join in and you'll probably win something because the sponsors want to give away stuff. So that stick vice is you stick a circuit board in it and solder on it. And it's sort of the rubber, you can't quite see, but it's got rubber grommets and you tighten it in. And it's much easier than having it on those alligator clip thingamajigs. Uh, the top left is just another one of those Karen bowlers. The bottom, yeah, it is the left, yep. The bottom left is a shield I made to go on the Karen bowler because that's what I had first. So that's got the radio module on it. And then I thought, I don't want to buy any more of these because they've got to come from Europe and they're expensive relatively. So I designed a second shield that plugs into the first one so I could then adapt it to have a different type of microcontroller. So on the right is a second shield which has an ESP201, which is another ESP8226, that amazing thing that came out of China about a year ago. By the way, I don't use the Wi-Fi in this. I'm just using it as a microcontroller because it's got low power and lots of memory. On the far right is another, the same circuit board, but instead of the ESP, it's got a Teensy in it, which is an ARM-based Arduino framework, but with more RAM than a, the usual Arduino chips. So basically, they all just plug together. So I've taken, I'm a software engineer, and you know, object-oriented programming, code reuse, and all that. So I'm doing it for hardware. So you can sort of see on the left there the different pinouts. I don't know if anyone else has ever done that. Maybe it's completely insane as a hardware thing, but... You know, I didn't know that, so I just did it. <laughs> of course, when you're waiting for circuit board fab, you've got to wait a few weeks. So there's a fair bit of this going on. Um, so this is probably why they probably know there's a lot of hardware manufacturing. So you've got to, six months to build, build whatever you're building. So lead times can be a bit frustrating. But again, I'm only working on this on weekends. You know, or I don't watch much TV. So after the kids and family go to bed, I'll hack on it. So most of the time, the time goes pretty fast, but you know, I still sympathise with my daughter's cat. So the next slide's going to get a bit more boring for a while. I'm just going to describe some of the various open source parts because I figure there's a lot of this and you might find something that's useful for yourself. So I've mentioned the Carambola. Uh, I've had this running on the Raspberry Pi 2. Um, there were just some bits that didn't quite port across exactly the same. Uh, the ESP266201, well, it's a hardware blob from China, so it's not exactly open, but GCC runs on it, so I'm using it as an Arduino microcontroller. I've turned off the Wi-Fi. I'm using it because it's got low power, and I had some, which is the most important reason. And the Teensy LC301. And again, from software, there's polymorphism. So this is a really cool project I found while I was looking. I, the Arduino IDE, um, yeah, um, so I wanted to use Qt Creator. And there were people with make files. And then I came across this. It's an open source project. I think it's only been around about a year. And I think it's someone in Eastern Europe or somewhere that's come up with it. I'm not quite sure. But platform.io, you run one command, and it creates a directory, and it gives you a sort of project file. And you run a second, you put your source code, the Arduino files into that, and you go platform.io build. And it compiles it and you're done. And it sort of magically does all, hides all the make file stuff for you. Where it gets really interesting, in your project file you can say, I want to use a Teensy and I want the same code to run on an AT328 and I want it to run on an ESP. I want all three of these. And provided you, in a couple of places I had to use an ivdev to tell it to change a couple of hardware specific things, but then platform I build, built the binary for all three of the microcontrollers, one after the other and it handled all the dependencies, it pulls down the tool chain off the internet, and you're done. And it's like, in half an hour, I suddenly had three microcontrollers, and then I could go platform I upload, and with the right serial port gadgetry plugged in, it would flash it for me. And uh, it's pretty amazing. The only downside is there's a bit of cloud magic where it gets the tool chains. Um, it's opaque. I think they're hosted on slash, not slash dot, SourceForge. Um, there's like a whole API, so it's done a really cool project. But if you really worry about the binaries that are used to build your binaries, you just go to the directory where it caches everything and point it at a local tool chain. So that's the workaround I used. Going up from the radios and the circuitry, I used a thing called MQTT-SN. So MQTT is an Internet of Things protocol. So it works on a publisher-subscribe model. So you have a device, a thing sitting out in a paddock that says, I'm going to tell you what the temperature is. Somewhere else on the internet, the other side of the cloud, I have a thing that says, I want to know what the temperature is. And in between, you have a thing called a broker that joins it together. 
MQTT SN is a variant I found which is designed for low bandwidth lossy links. So it's got a bit more stuff in it to do with, it, it doesn't run over TCP because the normal MQTT runs on TCP. So it runs on serial ports or radio links. So it's yeah, designed for that. Interestingly, there were various products that all have different licenses, some of which don't match up with each other, but luckily I was using them as binaries. So Mosquito is under something called the EPL, which I discovered was not compatible with the GPL. Um, Mosquito is a, a broker and tools for using MQTT, so that runs on Linux. MQTT SN tools had a more useful license, but again, I didn't need to change any code in these, I just used them, which is doing MQT SN messaging. And there's an Arduino library for this stuff, which is, so when I found there were libraries on both the Linux end and the microcontroller end, that was really awesome. I could just build stuff. I didn't have to do any work for any of that. And I think I just mentioned that, but the way MQTT works is you publish stuff on a topic. So it's kind of like a URL, but for MQTT. So my thing that's telling you what the humidity is says, I'm on farm on paddock six and the humidity is this number. And somewhere else I have a subscriber, but I've got that set up to say, just give me everything you've got. So you wouldn't go out on the internet and do that to a major known publisher, but on a private system, that's fine because you've only got a little bit of data. The MQTT version is going to be sending the topic everywhere over TCP, so there's a lot of overhead. So SN gets around that by having extra messages to do with registration, so you get back one byte instead of a whole string, and then you've got to send a lot less data. On the other side, on Linux, it's all OpenWRT based, just because I've got a lot of experience in using it. And it talks over the SPI. Linux gives you a SPI driver, which is a serial port interface that's on some of those pins on that photo I had before to talk to the radio module. SPI, I can get. Um, one wire, which is another bus for doing temperature measurements. I squared C, which connects to all sorts of stuff. In this case, I was using it to talk to a barometer, and so on. Uh, the interesting thing is that when you start using so many different libraries, you eventually find a bug. So I've got a couple of patches into OpenWRT out of that. And I think I've skipped ahead and already talked about that. So yeah, MQTT has a broker in the middle. This runs on Linux. It takes the messages that come over the radio over MQTT SN into a relay that reads it off the radio and pushes it into the broker and then sends it out as normal MQTT for anything that wants to know what's going on. So this is just a diagram that makes it probably easy to understand and all those boring bullet points I've just been through. So this is the inside of the gateway. Now I've actually got the gear here. It's deliberately a static display because the demo gods have not been nice this week. Um, so that's the gateway end. It's got an open WRT board in it and that's the inside of that box. Even though the circuit boards, there's still lots of ugly wiring, but you know, it works. So this is what you put, say, on a post out in the paddock with a solar panel and a nice antenna. And this is at the other end with an antenna connected to it. And then this has got a Wi-Fi relay back to the farmhouse. So normally that would be a couple of kilometres. And while you're at it, you might as well measure the temperature at the gateway. So I chucked a temperature measurer on there, which is that DSB18 chip. So that sits on the one-wire bus on Linux's side and measures the temperature at the other end. Because once you start monitoring some stuff, you might as well monitor everything because you never know how it's going to come in useful. So this is like a bigger picture architecture. So the OpenWRT gateway is aggregating all the MQTT data. Now that can push that off to other subscribers on your network or out into the cloud if you set it up right with VPNs and other stuff. But of course it comes to another subscriber on a server on the farm which can then collect the data and save it into the database. Once it's there, the farmer's got it and he can start analysing it once he's collected a bit and keep an eye on things. And of course he can calculate the grass fire danger index and decide whether he should drive out to his paddock with the header or wait to another day. So when we get to the back end, again, without all these other people in the past that have done all these other open source projects, this would have taken forever to code up. So I've got it running on a Ubuntu server, but you know, it's just Linux. I'm using Docker, and I'll go say why I'm using that in a minute. And Docker, well, everything on this page apart from Ubuntu and Python, I discovered while I was trying to build this project. 
So I can't stress, if you're going to go out and build something and have a good idea, you can probably build it, you just have to find it. You just don't know yet. I didn't know at the start, but by the end I knew all this stuff. So Carbon and Whisper and Graphite are a uh, sysadmins monitoring tool and Grafana is a web page. And so I repurposed that so we could have nice charts of temperature and humidity and so on. I had to write a Python script that would take the MQTT data and push it into Python. So I wrote, and someone else had already written most of that, I just had to modify it to suit my data. So God knows how many millions of lines of code are under those five bullet points and I had to write seven to make it do what I wanted. So it's <laughs> shoulders of giants. So again, here's another diagram. If you, it's black boxes of stuff. The docking container was interesting because I discovered Docker last year while I was trying to do stuff and I found Grafana first, which is a really awesome charting package. And then that uses Python and Node.js Node and 16 other things and you've got to pull this GitHub and that thing and this version and Debbie and Wheezy didn't support it and so on and it's like, oh. Um, but then I found on GitHub someone had done a Docker container that put all this stuff in one thing and I thought this Docker looks interesting. And now I've got like probably 16 Docker containers on my workstation at home. So, um, but basically what you have is there's a couple. One on the left actually runs all the processing and the web server and the database. The one on the right holds the data because one of the things with Docker is you can take down these micro virtual computers or whatever you want to call them and bring them up. But if you do that, all your data disappears. So I want to obviously maintain the processing code in the web page, bring it up and down, but I want to retain the data because the farmer needs that. So you can actually have it in a separate, let's call it like a, a virtual hard drive, which is you know, abusing the terminology, but it's off in its own container, which means I can back it up separately and keep it off while I can bring the other one up and down. So the data comes in to the Ubuntu server on MQTT, gets relayed into Carbon, into Grafana. Farmer can then come along, bring it up on his mobile or on his laptop and see what's going on. And so the next step would be, you know, you could write a, another process that instead talks to it and brings it out to a mobile app or whatever we need to do. So there's, once you've got this kind of architecture, you can scale it to do what you need. I think most people have some idea that this is true. So all non-trivial programs have bugs. So does hardware, which is interesting. So the ESP8266 that I was using as a microcontroller, this Wi-Fi processor that I turned off the Wi-Fi for, has a low power sleep mode where you can drop it down and it'll draw nanoamps when it's doing nothing, in theory. Once you desolder the lead that they've put on the power line, that's always drawing 20 milliamps. <laughs> um, the way this actually works is it must have a timer, which is the only thing going inside the chip. It actually asserts the reset line to reset the chip. So it needs to have a wire connected from one side of the chip to the other to actually function, which is a little strange, but I suppose it does the job. Once every 10 times, it would reset it and then crash with a log coming out of the boot firmware of the actual ESP itself, which made it kind of difficult to debug because it wasn't my code and I don't know whether it's hardware or firmware. Other people on the internet have reported this. I suspect a lot more people have this bug than they realise, but they just haven't been able to characterise at that level. But I got lucky. I thought, I'm going to muck around. I put a logic analyzer, which again is another one of these open hardware things you can buy from China, and put it on the reset line and another line, another line, and noticed all this fuzzy stuff coming out when I caught it crashing. And I did a bit more Googling and discovered, for some reason, this chip will put its main CPU clock out, one of the GPIO pins, when you first turn it on and then switch it off later when it feels like it. So that had me chasing that for a while to work out whether that was the problem. But in the end, I don't actually know why I was crashing, but I wrote a hardware watchdog, which would instead basically replicate the software function that says sleep for 60 seconds and then wake up and sample the environment again. Instead, sleeps for 61 seconds and then resets the thing if it hasn't detected any activity. So. Now, what people have done for years is they use a 555 timer and a capacitor and resistor, but I wanted it to be, well, adjustable because I didn't know what time intervals I was going to use. And, of course, that's a resistor and a capacitor you've got to find and a 555 timer, whereas you can use an AT Tiny 13 and do the whole lot with only one part, which is really useful. In the end, my theory is, is that their reset, reset pulse is not held open long enough and sometimes that just causes an issue on boot. Because what I, what I realised is every time it crashed, I could hit the reset button and it would still come back normally. 
So I just made my AT tiny hold it down for half a second as though a human and pushed it. So sometimes you just got to hack the thing till it works. <laughs> of course, one of our goals is to try and get the power down so we can run this off solar. Um, as part of that, we did a few experiments to try and understand how this works. So what you can do with an oscilloscope, and the photo's a little bit fuzzy, um, I've actually got a fair bit of older test gear that I've managed to acquire from work when they like to uh, dispose of it. So it's a 20-year-old crow, but it does the job. It's got a digital storage mode. So what you can do is you can, say, start sampling at this point and then capture it. These days you've got all these nice, tiny little things that you can buy, again, from China that do the job for you. But, um, the point is, what I did is I got a one ohm resistor and chucked it across the power supply line and then measured the voltage across that just to work out how much power is happening. So what you can see there is the bit on the very left is where it's turned on. And it's a bit hard to tell, but I think those spikes are where it's actually sending something out the radio. So, and then at the very end is where I've put that ESP chip into sleep mode. So I don't actually need to know how much current is going. I just need to know that this is roughly what's doing it. it Claims it's in sleep mode, well, obviously, something must be happening because it's using a lot of this power. So, it's not very scientific, but it proved that it's not, not, it proved that it's not not doing what it said it was going to do. So, <laughs> yeah. Double negatives for the win. This was the most fun bit. Like I said, JCAR Electronics is an hour's drive from my house. The other annoying thing is if you want to mount a circuit board, it has little, you can buy these little nylon poles, you know, a dollar each or something, or you can wait six weeks to get them somewhere cheaper off of eBay. But the other thing I did last year was I built a 3D printer from a kit. It took me most of the year because I only did an hour each weekend. Um, sometimes I got the kids to help me. Then I spent the rest of the year trying to make it work properly. Um, but once I got there, this is like the most amazing thing that's, like I said, is a great time to be a maker because, okay, I can try and go get some poles from JCAR, except the thing I want to put in is a little power supply circuit that doesn't have a hole to put a screw through. So how am I going to mount it? And so I sat down and I just cooked up this design, not knowing about the best way to design this stuff. I just did it off the top of my head. Oh, this will work. And it's got little slots on the left and right the circuit board slides into, and then little holes so I could put it on a piece of wood. And you can see that down the front there afterwards if you want to have a look. And where this is so cool is I went from, I've got this problem to two hours later, I had it in my hand and I could just bolt it on and it was like, yes. And it's the first time in my life I've ever had, I'd seen other people talking about this stuff, it's the first time I've ever experienced it. It was like the most amazing feeling to be able to do this. So I used a thing called Open SCAD to do that, which is a piece of software where unlike normal CAD programs where you've got to like move the mouse and all these obscure commands, instead you use a programming language which I guess for most normal people is just as bad, but for, as a software guy trying to do hardware, it was really awesome. Hey? Yes, I know, that's right, it was perfect. It's like, this is great. It almost looks like C, because it's got curly braces and stuff, so. Um, yeah. So I can sit there and say, I want this blob of rectangle stuff here, and make it go this big, and go over here and chop a bit off and put in a slice, put in a hole, done. Press a button, it goes to an STL file, put it in a 3D printer. Maybe. <laughs> no, I actually did this at home on Saturday morning because I sat down and I thought, I don't want to have to drive into the city because I do it all week and I need this thing. So yeah, it's uh, two hours later and it was done. So if you want to design something, have a look at this tool because it's just based on geometry and code. But you, know, you just copy what other people have done and then change it. Um, this was fun too. Because you need antennas to make any sort of range of the radio. And it helps if you know a ham. Um, thanks, Kim. That antenna that my friend Kim built for me, it's wood with bits of brass pipe. And they know how to do all this stuff. Uh, he said I could quote him, he said, hams are cheapskates that will do anything to save money, is what he told me to say. So, um, <laughs> that's sticky tape and wood. So the wood came out of the pile of fibre behind my shed. Um, and we went down the local harvest store, which is only 10 minutes away instead of an hour, and bought some pipe. And he built it. He looked up the formula on the internet which he knew the right one to look for because he has that knowledge as a ham and he built it for me. And he plugged it in and it worked really well. And the photo on the other side 
is someone with their hand out of a four wheel drive and went for a drive to test it and make sure it worked. So you can go on eBay or any other site and pay 120 bucks for a 915 megahertz antenna or you can build one for a couple of bucks. This was fun too. So that's my friend, the farmer. He's got a tower on his property that's several metres up. And I was more than happy for him to walk up there and me stay down the bottom. <laughs> He's got that antenna in his hand. And the other end there is about nine kilometres away where my house is. And it worked. So just to go back to the story now. So we got in the car after we built all this stuff and went for a drive because we didn't really know how far this stuff was going to go because I hadn't done any RF engineering. I just took the LoRa module, stuck an antenna on it. And they work like that close together. So we went for a drive and we got no elevation either. So one end was a pole out this high and the other end was a hand out a four-wheel drive window. And we made it about five kilometres before we lost the signal. What was cool is it actually worked through bushes and stuff. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing any of this stuff this way because I've been advised that 915 may have issues with weather and stuff and you might want to use 4 through 3 and all this other stuff, but it worked for us. And we're not, at the moment, doing this for any industrial purpose. It's just for use on a farm for a bit of assistance. Then we drove a bit further because we thought, well, what can we work out? And we got to a local footy club, which was seven kilometres away, and we drove up on its hill, so we gained two metres of elevation. And we got the signal back. So this is really cool. And that's when we went to James's farm, which is nine kilometres away, which is what we really wanted to hit. And when we got that, that was awesome. So um, problem solved. We don't need to go further than that because all these paddocks are within that range. So, you know, there's people have, there's all sorts of awesome advice, all sorts of people about you could do this and do that. But sometimes you just want to solve something and you don't need to go <coughs> further. You just do it with what you've got on hand, solve the problem, have a bit of fun. Um, and there you go. So we got to August and I got a couple more of my friends to help me um, and produced a video, so we had to make a video. And there were 900 worldwide entries and they had 100 finalists that all won a t-shirt and that included us, so we're pretty happy about that. Um, yeah. So we didn't get any much further than that because we were actually pretty exhausted by that point. We did go on and make the bigger video, but we'd sort of We've sort of done what we needed to do. We've had a lot of fun. Um, I think the prizes that won, they're all spectacular, so you should go check out the Hackaday website and have a look. But basically, you can do this too. You want to build something, just build it. It doesn't matter if you don't know how to do it when you start. There's so much stuff. We're spoiled for information on the internet. Um, people have done this before. Find your local hackerspace, join in, do stuff with people because it's fun. Um, it is important as you're going, though, to document what you're doing, which is one thing because I've come from a software engineering background, I do anyway, but if you don't, it can be really hard to go back and work out why something is the way it is. So that's probably the main tip. If, even, it's a fun project, but still write everything down. Because there's been times when I've had to go back through my notes, and what on earth did I do there? And I was able to find it, so. And I would like to thank everyone else that I've worked with on this. Um, we had a bit of fun, so, yeah. And that's kind of it. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Now we'll go questions. Considering the weather variations, have you had problems with devices out there either getting cooked or getting flooded or alternating between the two? Not yet, because most of it hasn't been out there yet. We've been mainly doing like closer range testing. Um, I have other people I've spoken to and they've had that problem. So you probably want to avoid having a black case that's in full sun. So we're planning to have um, like just shades. So there might be a pole with a solar panel at the top, but then we might have a piece of tin or something to keep the sun off it. Uh, another thing I've looked at is you can get certain, I think paint's the right word, but this material that you can coat the outside of a case with that's thermally insulating. They put it on roofs of buildings and stuff. And I was looking at maybe using that if I need to, but the other thing I can always do is run a cable down and bury it underground. So there's various ways to solve that. Um, I'm sure we'll have fun trying. We're also worried about sheep and kangaroos and stuff, so, <laughs> uh, yeah. Cockatoos, yes. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's lots of cable ties in this project. Um, <laughs> actually, you probably can't, I had the photo up, it was hard to see, but yeah, that whole antenna on a stick had nothing but cable ties, there were no screws or anything. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I understand that your friend is using this amazing system that you put together and seeing a benefit out of it. Uh, how likely do you think it is for all the farmers in the area to, you know, to get interested in to the, into this and to get involved into this and say, hey, I also want this thing, you know, this could help me. Yeah, that's a very good idea. Um, it's on our radar, potentially, but for me, this has been a side project, so, you know, it's just time, unfortunately. But, you know, I'm sure there are people in other places doing similar things. We've certainly th talked about you could, they have all their own data, but you could send it up to a web server and then share it and stuff, but, um, yeah. Hi, that was awesome, thank you. Um, you were testing those quite large antennas. Are you planning on putting those on every node or are you going to have leaf networks and relays and things? We haven't really thought through that far yet, to be honest. Um, they're cheap, it's wooden stuff. We'll probably use plastic. The idea, I think I'd probably end up 3D. We transmit for a few milliseconds every 20 minutes or something. So we don't think it's gonna be an issue. Um, that's something we're going to learn over the next year. Yeah. Cool. I was going to ask about the power one, but um, oh. I had one other observation. Are you, you're printing in PLA in that bit or ABS? At the moment, it's PLA. Yeah, because the PLA glass transition temperature is about 50 degrees, and they won't like Australian summers very much. <laughs> so I have a temperature sensor on the inside of the box too, so yeah. I'll be monitoring just to see yeah. how hot it gets. But yeah, it starts to soften at 50 degrees. Yeah, so that could be interesting, couldn't it? Yeah. No more questions? So were you able to make some useful estimates of the fire danger index in the end? No, we're hoping to do that for next summer. So we're sort of putting together the infrastructure and then we'll... We sort of didn't get it finished in time and then work and family and stuff. So um, the idea is to deploy this for real for the next harvest. So yeah. We might try and catch rainfall across winter yet. So it's like, cause yeah. Uh, you mentioned before that there might be weather issues with 915, but I suspect if there are weather issues, there's probably not that much fire danger perhaps. So it may not matter so much. Interesting. <laughs> Anyone else? Nope. Oh. All right. Thank you.